All right, Ben, I'll pass it to you. Okay, so, thanks, Wes. Uh, so our first speakers are Rick Stratton and Benjamin Gannon. Uh, ben is a postdoctoral researcher at Colorado State University focusing on wildfire risk assessment, firefighting effectiveness, and decision support for large fires. Rick is a fire analyst with U.S. Forest Service at the National Office in Fire and Aviation Management. His wildland fire interests include risk management assistance, uh, the RMA, uh, geospatial fire modeling, long duration fire support, fuel treatment design and effectiveness, risk assessments, and wildland urban interface home ignitability. Uh, let's get the presenter role transition to Rick for starters. Um, thanks, Wes, and take it away, Rick. All right. Hey, um, appreciate being with you today. Looking forward to this. Uh, I uh, have been working on this presentation feverishly the last couple days and I think I got in a pretty good place but I'm totally open to your suggestions and comments um, would really uh, appreciate those if you want to share them thank you Wes and, and Ron and uh, what, Diane everybody else for hosting this this is a great forum to, to, to share these kinds of thoughts I uh, want to quickly just acknowledge again Ben Gannon who's on here with us we'll say a few words and Jim Edmonds He's a programmer that helps from time to time on things and especially want to acknowledge um, the numerous LTANs that helped with this effort this last summer. You know, it's an incredibly challenging year and uh, could not have done it alone and want to acknowledge all those folks. All right, so I'm going to speak to the development and use of the fire comparison spreadsheet. This is uh, a RMA deliverable that's uh, first time we've ever really used it um, and uh, full disclosure I do not have a basset hound that's my sister's I, I'm a husky kind of guy I think a basset hound would have been selected out a long time ago if it wasn't for humans but that's the only picture I could find all right here we go so I wanted to first talk about just a, one slide on RMA and then we'll get right to the fires comparison so risk management assistance started in 17 in earnest um, senior fire leaders were very concerned about the trajectory of these uh, uh, large destructive fires and um, got together and tasked seven individuals, uh, initially ops and line, myself as analyst, Tim Sexton, um, Dave Culkin, trying to look at how, can, what can we do, what kind of analytics and other things can we do to help us with this challenging environment we find ourselves in. And so in 17, we developed those risk management assistance teams. You know, with time, as we started to deliver more things virtually, we dropped the T and it's become risk management assistance. So in 17, we were able to uh, go out as a team about 11 times, work with the local unit, work with the incident management team there, and start testing and developing some of these analytics and things that's now you know blossomed um 18 was we that was a little more and we started doing some virtual stuff on the side i, I also wanted to acknowledge um kit uh, you know kit is instrumental to risk management assistance and um to so many of the things that i'm working on now and i um you know he and i started assisting virtually as we were out on teams and that really became the direction that we were moving and i could see it going quickly so last year we we um maybe delivered uh 650 different products to these fires 66 fires and then this year we we i know of about 113 uh, fires uh that received army analytics uh this RMA effort, risk management assistance effort, that's going to be here for a while. It is not going away. It is a forest service initiative. It has very high support from the chief and um, department level um, and associate deputy, deputy chief, uh, WO fam. You will be hearing more and more about this for a long time and it will continue to blossom into um, many different avenues. It was first initially started with that uh, information from it was first initially used from life first where we pulled firefighters and asked where was their unnecessary risk and it also um, has roots in recent uh, national policy 
and in direction. And then also with the omnibus, we have to uh, report upward on uh, what we're doing with these fires and um, the challenges we're facing and the innovations. And RMA is a part of that reporting as well. All right, so 2021, we find ourselves with an incredibly challenging fire year. And this is kind of the quick timeline of the fires comparison spreadsheet. Uh, I'll get to showing you this. I'm gonna show you what goes into it first, but essentially all it is is a spreadsheet um, with columns, and rows, with data by fire, and, um, and then several tabs. So uh, I went over to Rocky Mountain in end of June, July, and showed them some, you can see this probability curves for a few of the fires they're having, showed them the Army dashboard, some of the uh, um, functionality on that, and Jolly Severe Fire Weather Index, and they, uh, through the rest of the season, through a little bit before that, actually, and the rest of the season, they actually were using Jolly's Index to help preposition some of the tankers when they saw that there would be um, extreme fire for, uh, potential for several days. Then uh, July 6th, Lolo had 44 different fires, and I first, the first time I ever really used the uh, what I termed the fire comparison spreadsheet was for the Lolo and helping them to prioritize those 44 fires. A little bit uh, later down the road, July 17th, we started, uh, NMAX started um, looking at this information. It was the initial FCS was for eight fires, and um, and then a little bit further down the road, we added a prioritization tab based on feedback. And a little bit further down there, we included radar charts, which was which we saw from Aaron um, Belval and um, thought it was a good idea and a good complement to what we were already doing. It, it uh, you know, this really took off. In the end, we uh, disseminated 15 times this uh, fires comparison spreadsheet, and it was used at local units that had multiple fires. NMAC, uh, GeoMax, uh, you know, even the GACs and predictive services. Um, the regions had a lot interested in, as well as WFAM and the Forest Service and uh, Department of Agriculture leadership um, were receiving the information from this as well. And there was a lot of interest for it. I think one of the things that I really appreciated was NMAC at first, I had a couple of presentations with them. At first they decided to help use it to inform type one crews um, deployment. And with time, that ex they extended that to type two. And then about a month later, they really saw the utility of this and, and uh, coupled it with their existing working, um, uh, uh, their, their working, um, what should I say, their organization they had and coupling with it and in turn um, they started using it for the uh, potential uh, allocation of instant measurement teams. So that was pretty awesome. Uh, roughly, I think there was probably uh, 280 different projections. Some of those are multiple fires. Sometimes we only had two at the very tail end. I think that was KMP and uh, Windy. And then the most we used in the comparison spreadsheet was 46. So, you know, that re represents thousands of simulations to get the results that we wanted and, and some of those were automated. So uh, keeping it simple, the FCS is uh, quantitative wildfire risk assessment. So just the risk assessments with the predicted fire growth. And a lot of that risk assessment information comes from Joe Scott and Pyrologix, which uh, just greatly appreciate those folks, Joe and Julia and everybody else. Um, and even um, WRC is the stuff we use was from Pyrologix and the, the uh, fire per Progressions were uh, fire projections were five, seven, ten, and fourteen days. It just depended on needs and timing, and how much bandwidth we had to do. Also, wanted to note, uh, you know, we use with this, of course, a lot for near term and FS Pro, and also started leveraging some of the automated runs that you can see from like Techno Silva or Pi Regents for, for for what I did this year. I was using some of Pi Regents because they were able to work with me quickly and a place to disseminate. Um, their automated runs. And with time, I started to use more and more of those. So what were the values that were assessed in the fire comparison spreadsheet? 
there was housing unit density and Microsoft Buildings. I like to have both because Microsoft Buildings also grabs some of those businesses. We had population count, critical infrastructure, drinking water, which is specific to those municipal watershed. Uh, I should, I need to uh, edit that. I should say municipal intakes. I will make a note. Um, the length of the major roads that were intersected. I also had suppression difficulty in there because I thought that was very important to see the potential for containment that it's going to be difficult. And then on some of the runs, we also included PCL and SNAG and ground evac. A lot of the local units like those, it helped them at least just a cursory look of, of the potential for containment and, and concern to firefighter safety. And then lastly, very key element uh, was the commercial harvest oil. It's called differently wherever you go, timber. Um, that was a element that many people wanted in there. And so in the end, um, through feedback, we initially just had the, the comparison spreadsheet and they, but they wanted it even summarized more than Mac did, and Mac did specifically. So I created this little prioritization tab, which is summary tab, and I'll show you that too. We also had severe fire index, uh, severe fire index, which was five to seven days a readme and a key. So this is the quick little uh, flow that um, Ben put together and um, we have it compartmentalized into three areas and Ben if you wanted to just uh, give this an explanation we'd appreciate it. Great Rick. Um, so as Rick mentioned uh, we were bringing in potential fire growth from a few different modeling systems and so uh, for this summer, we kind of tackled pulling together and standardizing the spatial data manually, uh, which obviously involves a little bit of work, but um, this allowed us to, to utilize those best projections. And so we're really just compiling everything into a shapefile. Um, we've got, you know, fire name, whether it's in a complex, uh, the associated GACs that we can organize outputs for delivery. Um, and then we ran through a number of automated spatial analysis. Um, some were pulling from these generalized national data sets that Rick mentioned we delivered to all incidents, but we also uh, built in the capability to be able to ingest some local data sets, for example, some custom layers that um, the GACs in California wanted. And uh, in, in all, we had about 80 gigabytes of data. And so one of the challenges with this is just um, who has access to it and be able to run it. Uh, we kind of kept it just localized for this first year, but that's definitely something we're looking to potentially host on a platform to have um, you know, increased accessibility to this information in the future. And so the geospatial stuff is really just um, some intersect analyses uh, using ArcGIS methods and then some zonal statistics using R to get those uh, means or sums of any of those risk assessment layers. And then um, Rick mentioned we also had some built-in graphics that we developed um, that were informed by Aaron Belville um, to help display some things to help people prioritize in multiple dimensions. And so the main output was really the fire comparison spreadsheet, which was in Excel. Uh, but we also uh, have some intermediate outputs that other people could utilize if they wanted to build into their own um, little custom dashboard. Is that enough, Rick? Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. So we're going to now just show you that fire, fire comparison spreadsheet and the prioritization tab. And uh, hopefully what we've showed you will come together. I think we've got about seven minutes left, so feeling good on time. So what you're looking at here is uh, an example of the fire comparison tab. And this is for August 28th through September 1. And you can see the fires on the left in the column different states as well. You know, the complexes, <laughs> we had a love-hate relationship with this, Ben and I, because it was, names were changing all the time. Um, fires refer to their fires as complexes. And so we we have that in there as well as a column and then uh, the GAC. And um, I, I made a, we made a subjective call on, you know, the estimated growth over the next five days. Is, is it going to be it compared to each other as a moderate, large, largest? And then we started sorting. And initially when we put this out, you know, I just thought folks would just sort based on what they're most interested in and, and that could help in aiding prioritization. But um, we, with time, developed the prioritization tab to, to help with that. So you can see housing units and buildings, population, 
you know, those, those uh, elements that I talked about earlier. And red, of course, red's bad, green's good. And um, there you have it. So that this just changed over time based on the time frame and the fires, the emerging fires went in and other fires that we, there was, were looking good, we took them out. So uh, the example of the prioritization tab is down below. And so if you wanted to only prioritize based on loss to homes and other buildings during this time frame with that five days looking at potential loss, Caldor would have been one and then Monument and French Dixie and uh, Schneider. Uh, the next column is critical infrastructure. And then there's drinking water, there's major roads, um, growth, right? Which one's anticipated to have the greatest growth? Severe fire weather, that's one from Jolly's. I'll show you a slide on that. And then uh, there's suppression difficulty. The other thing, as we noted, uh, you know, these these radar charts are great. Um, Aaron showed us these, and and I, I liked them. Um, we changed a few things, reordered things. We added timber, um, and I think it was a huge hit. These are scaled, so they're scaled based on Caldor. Caldor is 100%, if you will. And so, you, you know, you can look at. I'll go back. You can look. You know, some people want to dive into the fires comparison spreadsheet. Some people will really focus quickly on the, the tab itself. Um, and some people, you know, this speaks to them. I've, I've heard them called uh, spider webs, those spider web graphs. Can you send me one of those? That kind of thing. So I've, I've learned over the years, you know, it, it's, it's all about the right people and getting the information to them at the right time. Um, and and, and that, so that's very critical and in the language they understand, you know, and so we kind of have these three mechanisms of transferring this information. So if I don't, hopefully you can see this on the screen, but those are those major H4As um, structures and people impacted critical infrastructure, major roads, drinking water, and then merchantable timber. So you can see like there's, there's concern to drinking water for walkers. Um, there's a concern uh, to uh, critical infrastructure on French and so forth. So here's the severe fire weather index by Matt Jolly um, via the wildfire safe, which Techno Silva is helping, uh, is taking the lead on developing for him. And so, you know, I would just select the fires that are in that particular spreadsheet. This became a tab and again, red's bad and you could just cycle through. So for instance, Caldor, uh, when I did this poll, it was gonna have five days of pain and Monument had a very tricky day on the 28th and, and it looked like walkers would have some challenging weather as well. You know, that's a key component uh, in this as, as well. You know, it's reflected in the runs, but it's, I think it's also important to, to display this to folks. All right, so in guard to validation, um, I personally validated, uh, vetted I should say, each of the simulations that were used for the fires comparison spreadsheet. Kind of like the three bears, I, I gave a quick look and I looked at it and just, you know, based on my understanding of the fires and my experience over a couple of decades now, I, I was able to make just a quick subjective call. Mm, that looks too small or that looks too large. In those cases, um, I would do a rerun or ask the folks from the field to do a rerun. And then if I looked at it and go, yeah, I think that's in the ballpark, then we were good to go. You know, the, the, the results were typical. I'll show you this next slide that I worked quite a bit on uh, last night that I think you'll enjoy. But, you know, it, they yielded kind of that typical spectrum of outcomes. You know, there were a few misses and there were some exceptional, you know, runs. We had fun in PNW, we call them bragger bomb. <laughs> sometimes they're runs you brag about and sometimes they're total bombs. So, uh, but you know, a lot of this has to do with the accuracy of the fire model and the accuracy of the forecast. But I'm convinced if you have someone that knows what they're doing and they calibrate and they get a good forecast, you can really, you can almost, you can very often give them something that is a benefit. Uh, to that point, I got to speed up a little. Um, this is the first uh, run we did, those eight fires. And I just put them in categories from bomb to excellent. And you can see, so like on the Dixie Farm, California, I, I call this a miss. We got the trajectory right. A couple of the flanks look good, but we needed more on the head. And so uh, you could argue back and forth where this should go, but I put it there. 
the other Dixie in Idaho and green, I think did okay. And then here's three that I thought looked good. And then on Tamarack, we totally nailed Tamarack's run uh, for five days. If you look down at the bottom, this is something I thought you'd be of particular interest to you. As I look through these hundreds of runs, you know, 250, 300 runs, I think it was 260, 70. I would say that one and a half percent were a bomb. I'd say we missed the mark on about six. I, I uh, just subjectively said about 32, 33%, I think we're okay. About 43, I'd say we're good. And then exceptional ones were about 16, 17%. Two slides left, limitations. Um, the first one, you know, like, we're human for peace sake. <laughs> and we're using modeling to, you know, we're trying to model forest fires using weather forecasts and kind of dumb models, right? They're rudimentary. There's so much more we can do with fire science and you're, you're seeing the advances of that now. And when we get better science, we'll plug it in and keep advancing. There's limitations with the modeling. It's an incredibly dynamic environment. You know, there's emerging fires and you're always having to uh, reassess or plug those in. We've got folks on the field that are working the fire and making, uh, you know, having successes and fails, and you try to capture those. You know, this takes time. Sometimes things go down. You got limited capacity. There's differences in the risk assessment, and um, you know that the the potential. You know, trying to capture the potential for loss, but not giving a sizable over prediction is always a challenge. And then lastly, you know, um, some of the WUI metrics, you know, sometimes the county or the city stuff is more detailed than some of the things we're using. And then lastly, I won't go through these for the sake of time, but here are some of the improvements that we're looking at um, over the next couple of years. And just go through those bullets when you have a moment. And um, that's what I have for you today and happy to answer any questions if we have time. All right, thank you, Rick. We'll, uh, we'll hold questions for the end um, and keep plugging along.